As senior director of Girl Effect, Carvel Alawalia is part of a global effort to prevent the generational passing down of poverty. Her goal is to reach a powerful group with strong potential to break the cycle. Adolescent Girls. Launched at the 2009 World Economic Summit, Girl Effect and their partners challenge the world to see girls not as part of the global poverty problem, but as co-creators of solutions. Among their many creative and innovative programs is Nia Minga. Take a look. Nina Minga is inspiring and enabling girls nationwide to help Rwanda's transformation as a country. It's an identity. It's a movement. It's made by girls for girls. It's a quarterly magazine and a weekly radio show full of vital information that girls are sharing. Radio shows reach every region in Rwanda. 90,000 copies of the magazine go out every quarter. It's the highest circulated magazine in the country. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to build my own business as an electrician. Nina Minga, let me see that girls can succeed the same way as boys. Joining us now via satellite to tell us more about the worldwide work that Girl Effect is doing right now is Carvel. She's joining us from London. Thanks so much for being with us. Let, let's talk a little bit about the journal, journey. rather. Um, in terms of girls and women's rights, where are we now, would you say? I'd say we probably have quite a long way to go. Uh, interestingly, in Beijing 21 years ago, there was a landmark conference which um, illustrated all the ways in which women and girls suffered in discrimination and an abuse of their human rights. And this, this uh, conference was really a landmark conference because it showed state governments what to do about it. And I think what's really interesting is that whilst we've seen numbers of gains for women and girls since that time, 21 years ago, we've seen, you know, just as many um, challenges. So, for example, we see more girls than ever actually in school, but still mainly at primary and not at secondary school. We see unprecedented numbers of women in government, but again, you know, are they having just as much influence as men, as their male counterparts? We also see a number of new laws that have been passed around um, protecting women from violence, but um, we still see not enough work being done to actually implement these. And, you know, it's a sobering thought that nowhere in the world have we actually achieved gender equality. So we know we've made progress, but actually there's, there's still quite a long way to go. Talk to us about Girl Effect. How did it come about? Tell us about the genesis. Sure. So it came about some 12 years ago with uh, funding from a range of foundations, such as the Nike Foundation, the Nova Foundation. And I suppose initially it started very much about trying to get adolescent girls on the map. So what you find is that girls often fall out of, fall out of discourse around women and fall out of, you know, conversations around children. And there was a, a moment in time where people felt that actually we needed to focus in on girls and really understand the lives of adolescent girls so that we could, we could understand what were the problems they were facing, which were different to younger girls and different to older women, and see how we could actually ensure that they maximize their potential. So um, as we've come forward into Girl Effect, we work called Girl Hub, as we come forward into Girl Effect, we're really looking at uh, being a new development player, so different to some of the other existing development agencies, but looking at how we can work in a slightly more innovative space, working with brands and media. Where is your footprint? What countries uh, are, are we likely to see Girl Effect having an impact? So currently we are in three countries in Africa, in uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda and Nigeria. Um, but we also have an online presence uh, in 20 countries, uh, which is translating into 15 languages. That's, and that's globally across the world. The remarkable thing, though, and, and I, I find it remarkable, but I want to get your thoughts on this, is, is the impact you've had in Rwanda. You know, when you look at a magazine, and, and I want you to talk a little bit about that, too, because magazines are considered legacy industries. You know, you just can't get kids to pick them up. Nobody's interested in them. And yet the, the imprint you have there is remarkable. Uh, talk to me about that and, and the radio reach as well. Sure. So um, you're right. So something like almost half the population read this magazine. And when you actually have a look at it, it is in local language. But when you have a look at it, you can see that it's, it's really um, designed for girls, by girls. So it's very kind of text light, image heavy, um, 
it's it, you know it's, it's got a nice feel and touch and look about it and it comes out quarterly and then there's a, a radio program in between that and what that allows um, girls to do is engage with the with the actual magazine so they, it's something they can actually hold and take away um, and it is full of very inspirational stories so for example about um, you know the first female Rwandan air pilot um, and then also it's got stories about or factual information about things girls don't often hear about so things like teenage pregnancy menstruation um, and we've just seen that by, by being able to read about the issues, but then also engage in discussions through radio programs or listening groups, that allows girls to A, sort of absorb this new information that they're, that they're exposed to, but then really importantly have the space to discuss it. Because we know that, you know, it's one thing just raising awareness about an issue, but actually it's only through discussion, through reflection, through engagement with peer groups and other people around them that girls and those people around them will start to engage in different types of behaviour, more positive behaviour towards girls. Yeah. And one of the things we've seen is that uh, when we've done sort of an analysis of the impact of the magazine, something like 75% of the girls have said that, you know, they feel more confident as a result of reading this magazine and engaging in the process. One of the things I hear from people who are on the continent and one of the takeaways you hear when you have a conversation with them is that they get so unhappy with uh, Western NGOs because they come in with this one size fits all. We know exactly what's right for you. And there's not that deep engagement mm -hmm. with the people who really are the ones who are going to be touched by this. And by investing in the girls, getting them on board, it's really made a difference for you, hasn't it? I think that's right. And I mean, I think I would argue that NGOs do try to do that. They try and engage with local communities because we know that's how change actually happens. But I think sometimes that's challenging in terms of, you know, are we speaking to the right people? Are we actually getting to the heart of the matter? And that, that can be, you know, just logistically in, impossible and actually quite complex. But I think where Girl Effect does really well is, you know, it's found groups of girls that we get insights from. So one of the things we do in Nigeria is um, get girls um, to have access to phones where they can interview peers, so girls of the same age and sort of background, and ask them questions about their lives. And we can then get that information translated back to us within 15 minutes. And what that allows us to do is get a really deep insight into the lives of girls. And often, you know, if you go out into the field as, as someone external to that community, that creates a bias when they're giving you information. So what this does, because it's a peer uh, a peer mechanism where girls speak to girls from that own community. It's a way, a really great way of getting insights without the bias that a kind of foreign researcher um, would normally create. Talk to me about the club too. You've got like 10,000 girls uh, participating in it, right? Yeah, that's right. So one of the things I think to, to bear in mind is that when we talk about brands at Girl Effect, it's, it, you know, often we think about a brand as a logo and actually how we define it is something much more holistic. So we talk about having an overarching brand presence where, you know, you might be aware of, um, uh, you know, a local brand, for example, Nina Minga in Rwanda. But then that's delivered through these media platforms, which might be, for example, a radio program or a magazine. Um, and then what we also do is clubs, which is a way in which girls connect. And that's a space for them to really just come together as peers, you know, we're talking like 10 to 13, 14 year olds, and it's a space just for them. Often they're really kind of busy in their days doing household chores, going to school. So this is a safe space for them where they have mentors and where they're able to learn sort of life skills around, you know, what's menstruation, how do they, save, uh, how do they stay safe in their communities, how do they learn to save. Um, and also fun things, you know, like making jewellery and, and, and just having some fun, you know, singing, dancing. And uh, through this process, they learn what we used to call back in the day consciousness raising. So it's something around, um, you know, having the ability to analyse the issues that you face uh, and collectively seek solutions. And so this is a way that really boosts their self-esteem, their confidence, their ability as they grow into adult adulthood to deal with the issues that they might face further down the line. And the fourth component of the, the brand uh, work that we do is community engagement. Because we recognize that girls in and of themselves often are very low down the pecking order in terms of power in a household or, and much less in a community. So we understand the need to go beyond the girl and think about all those people that engage with the girl, that influence her life. So that might be parents, it might be caregivers, teachers, you know, um, people who have power in those communities. So we think about ways in which we can engage them in the work 
um, that we do so that we can create an enabling environment for girls to really thrive. Enabling environment, but is there pushback? Do you find some men who, who uh, just aren't accepting of this notion? Sure, there's always pushback because, you know, we're talking about age-old practices, age-old behaviors, um, and age-old kind of attitudes towards what's acceptable for girls and women in terms of the behavior, their roles in society. Um, you know, so when you start to question some of those things, it, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult thing for people to engage with. But I think it's about the approach and how you do it. So it's important that we don't alienate men. It's important that men are seen as part of a solution, the solution to the issue. When you, when you talk about mentoring, that's got to be a critical component to all of this, isn't it? That's right. So we, it's a really tried and tested approach. We know that girls really benefit from having particularly female role models. And so um, it's also a space, a small space, because remember these, these uh, networks or these clubs are quite small. So they have a lot of one-to-one -one time with a mentor where they can build trust and rapport um, to allow them to raise issues where they may not be able to raise them elsewhere. Um, and we know that that's, a, that's an effective way of allowing girls to surface issues, both with their peers and with mentors, and seek solutions for that. Can you talk to me about your radio reach in Ethiopia? Sure. So uh, in Ethiopia, we have a brand called Yenya, and it has a uh, TV show and it has a um, uh, radio program. And what we do is, the again, so we'll pick up issues in the TV program, and it could be on menstruation, it could be about making sure girls transition from primary to secondary school, um, or any, you know, female genital mutilation. Tricky things that actually you, it's difficult for girls to talk about. But what happens is that by airing it on this, on this program that goes out in Addis and Amhara, it allows people to engage with issues and that, is, that are now deemed more normal to talk about. So it kind of visibilizes issues, but it also visibilizes girls in a more positive way. So it kind of sparks conversations in communities outside girls, again, speaking to this enabling environment. And then what happens afterwards is after the uh, programs are aired, the, the same programs go out on the radio, bearing in mind not that everyone has access to the TV, so also it goes out on the radio. And then we have listeners groups after that. And that's a space where people can dial in, they can have like really active and energetic debates about the issues. And we, what, one thing we found is actually that men and boys are particularly interested in the, um, in the either radio or TV programs. And it's a really good way of engaging with boys. Just as I said before, that without engaging men and boys, we know that we'd get a backlash. So um, it's been a really good way to engage them in a positive way. Um, so that they can think about what, you know, what their role is to help girls achieve their rights. Thank you so much, Carvel. Really a pleasure. Thank you. We'll be right back with this week's Full Frame Close-Up.